This is the Weekly Squeeze, and I am your talented and lovely host, Hanala, coming at you live from the land of Israel with episode 208. I'm excited to share that the Weekly Squeeze podcast is supported by our amazing partners at Heartland Initiative, based in Yehuda and Shomron. Heartland Initiative is all about building real connections and creating meaningful change through public diplomacy, education, and grassroots projects. When they say they work across Israel, they really mean it, especially in the heartlands of Judea and Samaria. They're passionate about connecting international leaders, philanthropists, and professionals with their counterparts in these vital regions, finding common ground and fostering lasting partnerships. I am thrilled to be working with them so we can bring you this show in HD, fresh and juicy, every week straight from the land of Israel. It's a beautiful day here in the land of Israel following a very meaningful and intense Tisha B'Av Tuesday. I'm not a good faster on a good year, uh, but this year I woke up and I was like, hey, I ran. Well, I guess they forgot. Here we are. It's all good. Uh, but I was starving. Like I literally woke up starving. I hate fasting, but um, I, it was hard. It was, it was a hard fast because we're all feeling the solemnness of the year. And, and I think that's what really hit home for me. Like there, there was no escaping it this year. Our hostages are still trapped in Gaza. Our soldiers are risking their lives every single day to defend Israel. And most of you guys did not come, did not come this summer. And I know this because the streets are empty. You know, Tzfas is empty. The art galleries are closed and, and the airport is closed. Things are not as they should be. It's hard times. It is hard times. That's it. Make Aliyah. Like, don't hesitate to make Aliyah because I firmly believe that this is the safest place in the world for Jews and Arabs. Isn't it ironic? Don't you think? We are in a year of mourning, and the thought of entering another year of mourning, it's just like, it's too much. I mean, right after Tisha B'Av, thousands of Israelis attended a funeral for a lone soldier named Sergeant Major Cooper, who died of an allergic reaction to something that he ate. He served in the IDF for three years as a lone soldier, and then on October 7th, he came back to defend Israel and served in the army for 300 days. Okay, he left service three weeks ago, three weeks ago. This is some of the footage from his funeral the other night. Mika Amcha Yisrael. Mika Amcha Yisrael. This is from an interview that Jordan did the same day he made Aliyah. Let me read this to you. It, you know, you see these incredible guys. You hear their stories. Everyone is a world, a whole world. He said, I lived my whole life in an area with a very small Jewish population. Growing up in the type of town that I did, I learned very quickly that a Jew can easily become an outsider. My reason for wanting to move to Israel is that I wish to serve in the IDF. I feel it's my responsibility as a Jew to protect future Jewish generations so they can live in their homeland without fear or persecution. Uh, I, I know people have been to a dozen funerals this year. My daughter has been to two funerals. It's just, it's like, it's just a way of life. It became almost a way of life. And, and what's so particularly heartbreaking is that we have the best of the best defending our country. And it's extremely important that no one believes the lies and the, the exaggerations and the rumors that the world is trying to spread about the IDF because it, it hurts me personally to, to hear these things and to read these things. We have incredible guys defending Israel and, and what we're dealing with is psychological warfare. It's literally psychological warfare that our detractors are using to try to get us to, ha to, to fight eternally and to doubt ourselves. I mean, how could anyone doubt that the Israeli army is the most incredible, competent, moral, ethical, you name it, that's what they are. And, and, and it's because they're made up of terrific guys. And, and they, know what we're, they know what we're fighting for. And that's what we have to do. We have to keep our eye on the ball. We have to remember that this is our land and this is the reason we're defending it because it belongs to the Jewish people. It's our historical and ancestral homeland, every single inch of it. 
And when we constantly remind ourselves that, we're, we can be equipped for this very, very long and intense fight. Ultimately, the more we stand united, the more we are, are shoulder to shoulder in all of this, you know, that's, that's how we'll succeed. And we will succeed. We're going to find every single last uh, terrorist piece of garbage, wherever they are, in whatever tunnel they're in, in whatever hotel room they're hiding in, whatever runway they're running down, we're going to find them. And we will win. All right. Did you guys hear about the ERA's tour? Or should I say the terrors tour? Now that the Islamic jihadis managed to do what not even crazy Kanye West accomplished. They shut down Taylor Swift. They shut her down. But never fear, she was back the following night with a new and improved costume set, proving that the best way to get millions of people to support you is to do it their way or not at all. Uh, it's not so easy to shake it off when your fans' lives are threatened because you didn't publicly throw your support behind Free Free Palestine because that's what it is. This is pure intimidation. This is using violence and fear to get attention to your cause. And any cause that requires violence and fear is not worth supporting. And, and it's, uh, listen, I was very upset with Taylor Swift. I was like, I, I just couldn't, it didn't make sense to me that someone in her position, someone who is one of the biggest stars in the world, I mean, this girl is like Elon Musk, Oprah Winfrey, Trump, like that's Taylor Swift at this point. She couldn't find the words to stand up for Israel. She couldn't, she just couldn't figure it out. She could not figure out how to say something that would let her fans know that she has a moral compass and she knows what's right and she knows what's wrong and that her fans that live here in Israel, and she has many fans that live here in Israel, I saw them in the airport last week. They, they went to Berlin to see her perform, and she was not there for them. She was not there for them. And the reason she wasn't is because she thought, well, listen, I'm going on tour now, and I, I don't want any drama, and if I just you know, don't say anything, then maybe they'll leave me alone. But that's not how it works. That's not how it works with the enemies of Israel. They're never going to leave you alone. They're just never going to leave you alone. They are there to intimidate and to cause harm and to spread the intifada and the jihadi vision for all of Europe and the world. And Taylor Swift is just going to be right there, caught in the middle of it because she's Hurricane, you know, Taylor. So I just think that she, you know, bit of, you know, I get her position. I get that it's hard. I get that she's in a tight corner. She's darned if she does, darned if she doesn't. Um, for that reason, I just feel like do the right thing. Like, if you're anyway, you're not going to win this. Like, there's no way you're going to come out unscathed. So just do the right thing. If you stand with Israel, you're doing the right thing. And uh, you'll be blessed. Let's talk about the Olympics. I think Israel did great because Israel did great. We sent men who are men and women who are women. And no one participated in the breakdancing competition, thank God. The only ones that, that is, the only people Israelis want to see breakdancing are terrorists if you catch my drift. So this marked Israel's 18th appearance at the Summer Olympics, with 2024 being Israel's most successful in terms of the number of medals won. Leave it to Israel. Like, we, we go through the most atrocious year possible. Everyone is falling apart, and we're like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to send our Olympians to the Olympics, and we're going to show them how it's done. And they did it beautifully. They did it with grace and dignity and grit, and I am very, very proud. My, my daughter is uh, a gymnast, and I was very proud. We had seven silver medals, I think, seven silver medals. And you know what? Good for them, because did you know that they get a whole bunch of money? I didn't know this. Yeah, the, the athletes, the Olympians, they get a whole bunch of money. Listen to this. Had I known, by the way, I might have gone into uh, professional sports, because I'm very not graceful. Um, Israel will now have to shell out five million shekel tax-free to each of the medalists, plus an additional 2.5 million shekel to the winning coaches. You don't even have to be an athlete, just be a coach. Handing out the highest bonuses to date, by the way, I don't know who, how we have any money left, um, and amongst the highest given in the world. Israel pays their Olympians some of the highest giving in the world, only after North Korea, who pays them nothing. <laughs> the government will award one million shekel to the gold medalist. 
That's pretty awesome. 700,000 shekel to each silver medalist and a half a million shekel to the bronze medalist. Kaching, Olympians, good business. What can I say? The Olympics, like everything else, have been hijacked by wokeism and jihadism and, and Islamism. And we had situations where competitors didn't even want to shake hands with their opponents because of their political issues. Um, but Israel, you know, we just did our thing. We kicked Tuchis all throughout the games, and that's because we have we have good values. So go Israel, go. And to the Turkish wrestler who lost in three seconds to an Israeli opponent, he's like, I'm not shaking his hand. Okay, no problem. The fight starts. The Israeli put him down in three seconds flat. And everyone was like, that's what you get. That's what you get. What goes around comes around. Uh, we're just, I don't know. We're just, we're not so trite. Like, like grow up. You know, just grow up. If, if everyone would just stop obsessing about how much you hate what Israel isn't, we can all just go to the Olympics and have a great time, right? That is the idea. Anyway, of all the clips that I saw, my favorite is when the athletes landed in Ben-Gurion and everyone was excited and they were cheering and they were safe back in Israel. And at the end of the day, we don't need validation from the world. We are winners and whoever doesn't support us are losers. Great clip out of the UN, or what the Lubavitcher Rebbe called a den of wolves, in which you can hear Israelis, um, Israel's ambassador, Gilad Erdan, wipe the floor with the Palestinian representative and all the other mentally impaired, pathological, Jew-hating liars uh, who call themselves the United Nations. So he calls out the Security Council. He's sitting there in this room with all these tyrants and dictators, and he holds up a picture of the Hamas terrorists, right? Remember the Hamas terrorists? The, the students and the children and the babies that were in that, that, that school, remember that? And he holds up the terrorists. He's like, this is who we took out in that school that you all lied about. He said, about that, you guys made an emergency, emergency session because there was a, a, an Israeli missile in a school. But when 12 children were blown to pieces by Hezbollah, 12 innocent Druze children playing soccer on a Saturday morning, nobody blinked an eye. And that's what we need a representative in the UN to say, and it's horrific. And the Palestinian, I, I, I don't even know why they have a representative if they're not a state, but the Palestinian representative, is, he's just, he made some sort of like gesture with his hand, like ki'ilu, and it, the behavior there is a disgrace. It's truly a disgrace, and when you, see them overlook the lives of these Druze children. And that, that village, Majul Shams, they, they, that, that destroyed them. And the world just kept on moving without any acknowledgement to, to, to the fact that, the, that, that supporting terrorism destroys lives, innocent lives. Just no recognition. I have been immensely, immensely proud to represent my country here, the most moral, country in the world, the most moral country in the world. You listen, Palestinian representative, in this warped place. I hope one day you will also see the bias and perversion of morality here and pray, and I pray that you will see the truth. The terrorist organization that this guy represents here and tyrannical regimes should be condemned, not protected and that Israel should be praised. We are today the vanguard of civilization. We are the vanguard of civilization. But until then, Am Israel Chai. Thank you, Mr. President. So thank you to uh, Mr. Erdan for your outstanding work. You're a light in the darkness. You're a rose amongst the thorns. You're a warrior for Israel surrounded by despots and tyrants, and you, you make us proud. I mean, it's not hard to look good amongst that company, but still. All right, a letter from the White House from President Joe Schmo Biden, who we last saw shuffling from the White House to a helicopter that took him to the beach to play in the sand. Apparently, he wrote a letter back to a nine-year-old kid named Eitan, who sent him a letter asking him, to help Israel in its war against Hamas, okay? So this is the response. This is what President Biden wrote to a nine-year-old child who obviously was a little concerned that 
he was hearing the American president wasn't supporting Israel, where he lived. So this is President Biden's um, reply to him, to Eitan. That was loud. Thank you for writing to me. The people of Israel lived through a moment of pure evil on October 7th, when more than 1,300 civilians, including Americans, were murdered by terrorist organizing Hamas, or the terrorist organization Hamas. So far, so good, okay? He goes, the reports of atrocities are seared on our souls. Parents killed while trying to protect their children. Young people massacred while attending a music festival. Entire families slain. And so many more innocent, wounded, or taken hostage. For many across the United States, Hamas's terrorist assault was not only painful, it was personal. It, resurf it, it resurfaced horrible memories left by millennia of anti-Semitism and genocide. And it was the deadliest day for Jews since the Holocaust, one of the worst chapters in human history that reminded us that silence is complicity. I want you to know I will not be silent. Okay, this is from President Joe Biden who has been silent and unavailable and on vacation and completely MIA. And I don't know if he's talkative when there's no one around, maybe he talks to himself, but he's been very silent. And also, this kid is nine. Like, just, just right, I stand with Israel. We're destroying Hamas. You know, we're standing up to Iran. Sorry for all the misunderstandings. I, I, you know, I, I, I haven't been well since I fell off my bike. You know, I'm sure you can relate. And that's it. Here's a sticker from the White House. Like, he's writing a whole... It's clearly a, polit a political message. Like, it's clearly something he was hoping, like, everyone would read. And it gets worse. Then th this comes the part that I'm sure, like, Ka Kamala added. She was probably like, Mr. President, like, here's your tea. Let me just reach over your shoulder and type a little paragraph. The United States stands with Israel. We will continue to ensure that Israel has what it needs to defend itself against terrorism in accordance with international humanitarian law. I will bring all resources to secure the release of hostages... Still waiting. This letter was in June, uh, July, but still. Held by Hamas, including our fellow Americans, which they didn't name because it just doesn't roll off the tongue. If the names rolled off the tongue, they would have put it in the letter. Uh, I will also do everything to ensure civilians are protected, providing humanitarian aid to innocent Palestinians. There are no innocent Gazans. There just, there just aren't. As much as you would like to will them into being... That is not the case. But the president said so, so. Um, and continues and prevent this conflict from spreading across the region. And I will continue to work steadfastly with partners to pursue peace and a two-state solution. How are we even talking about a two-state solution? I, 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 this, I, there's no two-state solution. There's no solution. There's no solution. There's no two. There's no state. There's nothing. There's only terrorism. So this nonsense with a two-state solution. And now after all of this... It's just beyond, it's just, um, so all, so the Jews, and the Israelis and Palestinian people can both enjoy equal measures of security and dignity. Yeah, we're totally into that. Maybe tell it to the Palestinians. No, okay, we're not, there's no two-state solution. Here at home, I've directed my team to identify, prevent, and disrupt any domestic threats that could emerge against Jewish, Muslim, Arab, or any other communities. Why? Why are we, wh what would happen if a letter would be written that would condemn anti-Semitism and it wouldn't condemn Islamophobia, like, I, I just want to see, like, would the world explode? Like, what would happen? Like, what would be so terrible if we could address what the, the, the letter writer is concerned about? Like, it's just so, so infuriating. I don't know. I just, like, I don't know how the flying falafel ball, the Muslims, got into this letter. I just, it just, Eitan doesn't care. He doesn't care. Anyways, under my administration, blah, 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 we'll fight anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, free, free Palestine. Oh, no, that's not there. This is what America stands for. Sincerely, Grandpa Joe, Mr. President. So I was underwhelmed, to say the least, by this uh, letter to Eitan. Meanwhile, he also wrote a letter to Trump. Hang on, there we go. He also wrote a letter to Trump, who just wrote back, no one loves the Jews like I love the Jews. And we're going to win hugely in September. And we're going to get rid of homeless once and for all. Vote Trump. So I thought that was appropriate. Okay, quick question. If you could make a real impact every single day with one dollar, would you do it? Sounds too good to be true, right? It's not. 
This can be done and it is being done by daily giving. You guys know I love daily giving, the tzedakah fund of the Jewish people. So here's the deal. You sign up at dailygiving.org and they do everything else. That's all it takes. Every day they're going to take your $1 and everyone else's $1 and they're going to give it to vetted Jewish charities doing amazing work, feeding the hungry, supporting families in crisis and so much more. It's like an easy button for charity, you know? Set it and forget it, like Charlene always says. And your dollar is going to go to amazing charities that you want to support. Uh, Bone Olam, Amudim, Camp Hask, Ezer Mitzion, Mayor Panim, Pantry Packers, RCCS, United Hatzalah, all these charities that you always see and you think, I'm going to get my credit card, I'm going to do it. This way, you sign up for daily giving, and they take care of all the legwork. And that's it. For less than a buck, you're making a difference every single day. You're part of a movement, $1 a day, $1 at a time, helping people and saving lives. No stress, no hassle, just pure impact. So what are you waiting for? Just go for it. Join the thousands on this podcast alone who signed up and started changing the world today. People email me all the time. I still get my emails from Daily Giving and it tells me where I gave that dollar that day and it makes me so happy that I did a mitzvah and I didn't actually have to do anything. It's just automatic. Uh, It takes less than a minute and trust me, you'll feel awesome to know you're giving a dollar a day. Go to dailygiving.org and make a difference. So in case you've been watching for a while now and you're still not quite sure who I am or why you're here or why you're enjoying this so much, let me reintroduce myself to all our new listeners. Who am I? I should have brought my therapist. (laughs) Uh, I'm an American, and no matter what Professor Alan Dershowitz thinks, I think there should be a moment of silence in all public schools every single morning. And while we're at it, bring back the Pledge of Allegiance. I am a Floridian, a.k.a. the final stop before you realize you're making Aliyah. I am a Lubavitcher, and I have a bunch of Rebbe dollars to prove it. I'm an Israeli Ola, going on eight years. As a matter of fact, I think my Aliyah anniversary is next week. I'm a singer and songwriter, and you will find my music on Spotify. The link is in the show notes. I'm the creator of Bella Bracha. If my voice is familiar, it's because you probably heard it in the back of your minivan. I'm also the writer of Parsha Time. I'm a seasoned performer. As a matter of fact, I wrote an entire masterclass on show business. Yeah, the link is in the show notes. (laughs) I am a very proud, mediocre mom of four extraordinary kids. By the way, mediocre moms make the best kids. I mean, how else are your kids going to learn how to cook if you don't keep burning everything? I'm a dog mom. Dogs are the best. My dog, she makes me feel close to my Bubby Felig, who loved dogs. May her memory be a blessing. And Bubby Mutchkin, if you're watching from Crown Heights, I got a dog. I know I didn't tell you. Surprise. I'm a wife, and my husband is Sephardi. I know I say that all the time. I have people who play a game. They take a shot every time I say my husband's a Sephardi. But he is, and that's worth making a l'chaim over l'chaim. I'm a sister, sister, and a daughter, daughter, and a cousin, and a friend, and a neighbor. I'm a podcast host, an Israel advocate, a social media influencer, and an IDF pool party fundraiser. I am a one Jewish state delegate, and you are going to be one too. We actually need about 300, so 300 of you are going to join me on this. For more details about American Ambassador to Israel David Friedman's movement, join the Weekly Squeeze WhatsApp chat where I will post the information about that, okay? Did I miss anything? I'm a Zionist. I am a Zionist and a vegan. Just kidding. Israel has the best chalavi ever. But most importantly, I am a Jew, and not a Jew with trembling knees, but a Jew with a proud claim to the land of Israel. And no one can take it from me, the land that I love, the land that I need. Are you singing yet? That's I am the land. That's my anthem. It's on Spotify. All right, if you're wondering how I have all the energy to do the cool things that I do, uh, I'm super busy, but I have a secret weapon, okay? Life is crazy. People are trying to kill us, and that's just the terrorists, not even our kids. And we're trying to keep it all together. So if you're feeling stressed and overwhelmed and a little moody, I have something for you. Rather, Caroline has something for you. This is Queen Tulsi. 
and it's what keeps me calm. True story. Okay, so what is Queen Telsey? I'll tell you. It's an incredible all-natural supplement that it's a game changer. It will become a game changer for you. It has a blend of five powerhouse herbs that work together to help you feel more relaxed. They boost your mood and they give you the inner peace, the zen that you need. And the best part is that there's nothing artificial in it. It's just pure plant-based goodness and 100% kosher. Let me tell you, Queen Telsey will help you sleep. It'll help you handle stress. It'll help you handle mood swings and that 3 p.m. slump when you just want to climb into your bed and listen to an audiobook for two hours. I don't know anyone like that. <clears throat> it has adaptogens, neurotropics, and anti-inflammatory herbs all packed into one little capsule. You take one, you take two, three or four. Um, it's much more effective than just having another cup of coffee. And you'll notice right away, you'll feel more calm, your mood will be better, and your skin will be glowing. Caroline, who came up with this incredible mix of herbs, she looks gorgeous. I've, I, I've, I had her on my podcast. You guys know that I love uh, Queen Tulsi. So if you're dealing with stress, brain fog, or just need a little extra support to keep things together, give Queen Tulsi a try. You deserve to feel like a queen every single day. I'm glad I found it, and I know that you will be too. All right, it's time for our terrific guest. You're in for a real treat today, guys, because my guest is a powerhouse, someone who's been fighting in the trenches in the world of Israel advocacy for over a decade. With his unmistakable red beard, giant Nick Kipa, and deep commitment to both his faith and the truth, Joseph Cohen is far more than just an advocate. He's a true force of nature, King David vibes. Take a look at this clip. This is how Jews get treated in London. This is how Jews get treated in London. Joseph is the co-founder of the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism, and he created the largest website focused on Jewish-Muslim relations. If you recognize him, it's because he is the face of Israel advocacy movement, literally taking it to the streets, engaging with all kinds of thugs and aggressive Jew haters, many very violent. This guy is tough as nails. Don't let his blue eyes fool you. But he understands what he has to do. He's countering anti-Israel bias and making sure that the truth gets heard and understood. And what I think is so awesome about Joseph is that he's just like the rest of us. He's on a journey to learn and grow and understand and most importantly, teach others. You can follow him on all his socials. The links are in the show notes. So without further ado, alternative peace activist Joseph Cohen. Joseph, welcome to the Weekly Squeeze. Thank you. It's incredible to be here. Thank you for making the trip out to our fancy new studio. Um, it's the third time we're meeting in person. You came to one of our barbecues. That was great. And we met at the October 7th exhibit. And now you're here. And I still know nothing about you. So let's dig in, <laughs> shall we? All right. I know you have an English accent. So yeah, tell me about your childhood a little bit and how you grew up and, and how you basically became this famous religious Zionist activist. So I have a very unconventional story. Um, I was raised um, in a very left-wing household. Um, I was raised on a strict diet of Marx and Engels, as were all my siblings, in a working class um, mining village in the north of England. My parents, our only identity um, Jewish identity was one of anti-Semitism and wow. I, I remember from a young age Nazis smashing my father's business's windows because we, we, the surnames Cohen they're Jews they're Nazis we didn't belong in their community um, by their thinking and so from a very young age I was fighting fascists in my community I saw Israel as the only place where Jews could be really free of anti-Semitism or at least able to stand against anti-Semitism. Uh, but there wasn't much Yiddishkeit in the village. And so I decided, um, actually after a birthright trip to Israel, to become observant. It's a long story, I won't <laughs> bore everyone with that. But I moved to, to London, to, to Golders Green, 
And that put me in contact with the Muslim community, the Jewish community. I saw there was quite a lot of division there. And so I, I launched my first initiative, which was um, a website dedicated to promoting the, um, the, the common things that Judaism and Islam have in the hope that that would breed tolerance. Well, this was when things were still salvageable. This was, um, I still believe they are salvageable, but this is a, a large part of the work I do. And um, for, for context, millions of people watch my videos uh, only a fraction of them are Jewish. 17% True. of my audience True. are if you Jewish. you go into the comments, yeah, that's why it sparks such a heated argument because people are hearing things that they've never heard before. And if you look at the, the state of the world today with the United Arab Emirates and Muslim nations reaching out to us, um, extending the hand of friendship, there are real people that we can actually connect with and change the world. If you spoke to our ancestors 500 years ago and told them that today the closest friends of the Jewish people are going to be the Christians, they would look at you like you're an absolute lunatic well, because they, then yeah. Christians were ripping our skin from right. our bodies. There have, there's been a, a, a reformation and that's, I mean, the only way we can live with them. Ultimately. Yeah, but but you go, uh, please God, we can see the similar things within the Muslim world. So my focus was um, focused on Muslims. That put me in close contact with the Muslim community. I'm giving the very brief history. Um, put me in contact with the Muslim community in a big way. And I realized there was a real problem of anti-semitism within um, within britain particularly coming from the muslim community and so i launched the campaign against anti-semitism um which was at that point very much a street um level campaign um combating anti-semitism on the streets online where the the the, the guys that run it today have taken it as heights I could never have. They're a phenomenal team. They do incredible work. If you're not following them, out, following them check them out, the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism. Um, and what happened was you had the 2014 war and anti-Semitism was everywhere. Hamas, Hamas, Jews to the gas. Hitler was right, like today, not as extreme as it is today, but a, a similar nature. The war stopped and it disappeared overnight. But so what you, persisted? Yeah, I'm saying th those were your your earlier videos that went viral as well. This was before October seventh. So way, 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 way before. Yeah. This is your, this is like ten years ago. Um, but what persisted after the 2014 war was I don't hate Jews. I just hate Israelis. I don't hate Judaism. I just hate Zionism. And I realized in that moment that anti-Zionism is the acceptable face of anti-Semitism today. And everyone that was involved in interfaith would never talk about Israel. And our focus was on the wrong place. And so I decided that the battle is Israel and the medium is social media. And so I took the fight to them. Uh, and um, thank God we've, we've won over a lot of people with the content that were, that's created. But the, the, the real battle, the elephant in the room that we, we need to discuss is Israel and the legitimacy and the right for the Jews to have a state. Right. People. Like, but, how do you even begin to tackle that? Tell people, like, what you learned when you first got the courage to just go out there and, and you know, push back. So I think the key thing is actually understand who it is you're talking to, not even what you're about. So what most people don't, they could see me in a debate with a um pro-Palestinian academic or they are some ISIS thug on the streets. Um, the person I'm speaking to may not be the person that I'm engaging with. It's the audience. It's their followers. It's the crowd. And it's understanding the message that I want to send to them. Bit of a show. And, and so, for instance, with Islam, with Muslims, if I'm trying to win Muslims over, I will go to their religion and use their religion to support our right to be here. If I'm speaking with Christians, I will go to a different place. I'm speaking to communists. So it's understanding the audience and the, the actual message that you're, you're trying to convey. But you've got to read. <laughs> you've got to read a lot. Yeah, I'm saying lot, it's easier said than done. Like you really have to know what you're talking about. You do and you don't. You have to think on your feet. You do and you don't because Israel is one of those subjects where everybody has incredibly strong opinions and they're very vocal with those opinions and you scratch the surface and they know nothing. The experts know nothing. Never mind the guy you're bumping into on yeah, the street. I've seen they some know. of your interviews. They're absurd. Yeah. yeah. There's just so much false history and false narratives around this that it's very easy. If, if you're watching this podcast, you probably have more knowledge than the average person that's on the street. I know, but it's hard to believe that because they're so, first of all, completely convinced of whatever it is that they, they're yelling in your face. And they're so enraged. So you think, well, they must believe what they're saying because that's why they're so furious. But... You know, I, I saw a, uh, just recently a clip where they're yelling 400,000 Palestinians, whatever the numbers are, 
they're livid, but at the same time, like there's nothing really to back up this information. So something driving, I mean, it's hate. It's hate, no? You, you're saying it, that it's not hate, it's just misinformation. But I'm saying, why are they so desperately clinging on to this misinformation? I'm saying it's anti-Semitism. Um, it, it's good. Uh, for, for context, in 2014, um, ISIS established their caliphate. 110,000 people were killed that year. Three million people displaced by that year. Huge, entire cities razed to the ground. I went to their protests. You'd have five people protesting against ISIS. Five people. When 150,000 Palestinians were forced to flee Yarmouk, there was a vigil held for the Palestinians from Syria who'd, who'd been forced to flee. There was maybe six people there and myself. I was a Jew. And they had no one, they had the TV cameras there, so they had no one to interview other than me because there, were, there, there was no protest. There was a big protest mobilized that year for Syria. It was uh, mobilized in the UK by a, um, a left-wing organization called Stop the War Coalition. And they were protesting to stop the West from intervening. <laughs> right. So, right. There was no anti-ISIS post. Right. No anti-ISIS post. Now you fast forward to, to, to today. You have the biggest massacre of Jews that has occurred um, since the Holocaust, you have a war that follows where Israel goes to incredible lengths to minimize civilian, civilian casualties. casualties. Like half a, 500,000 tons of aid, more than that, um, moved into humanitarian corridors established. Millions of phone calls and leaflets dropped on neighborhoods. A war like this Maps has never created. been done. Nothing yeah. like yeah. this ever happened. Yeah. The charge of genocide. Right. The charge of gen it's ludicrous. When it's a fraction of the Syrian, even if you go by Hamas's inflated numbers, which includes Hamas terrorists, even if you go by their numbers, it's a fraction of Syria. But there was no cause for genocide. There was no mass protest on the streets. So what's the difference? Jews. The only difference between this is the, obviously the scale of the Syrian, but there's Jews involved in this conflict. The global opposition to what's happening, yeah, the, the global opposition into the, to the current war to Israel is generational anti-Semitism. You can't shake off 2,000 years of anti-Semitism. The interest in this conflict is it's a Jewish conflict, the only Jewish conflict, and it dominates the headlines. Right, and that's why we're going to see all the elements of anti-Semitism. Like we were talking earlier, we're going to see, um, obviously, gaslighting, or Gaza lighting, as they call it. Um, and, and in general, there's just this strategy that they use to bring us to this place that we're defending ourselves constantly um, against things that they're doing to us, appropriation. They literally appropriate the things that, we, that they're doing to us and then accusing it. It's, you kind of feel like you're in the twilight zone. Like, it, how do you keep a straight face? And I've seen you not keep a straight face, but th like I said earlier, the lengths that they take to, to argue things. And, and if it is just blatant anti-Semitism, we know that it's impossible to, to fight. It does. I mean, perhaps with education and with enough pressure, and we can have you know hope for this generation. But I don't know. I'm not. I don't. It's it's certainly a tidal wave that um, we're we're trying to like hold with little buckets. You know, it's just it feels very overwhelming. So, if it's just concrete anti-Semitism, right? What's the plan? So the the, the thing with anti-Semitism is you can win. You can win people over from anti-Semitism. My comments, I get thousands and thousands of comments, and it's a combination of thank you for changing my mind to we're going to kill you, Jew boy. And <laughs> there's like very little in between right. those two. And the what's very, very powerful is data. You'll be able, when you finish this podcast, you upload it, you can look at where people are viewing it from. And I know with my data, like I actually, my videos are far more considered than most people realize. When I'm responding to a Muslim in the street, I'm thinking of the platform, I'm thinking of the format, I'm thinking of the objective of my response. And it's very calculated. Everything is incredibly calculated and incredibly purposeful. And you can then analyze how successful that was or wasn't. So if I'm trying to Come reach out like to a Muslims. Strategy, right. exactly, so one of my most successful videos is a video called A Jew Refuses to Convert to Islam. Um, on YouTube alone, it's 4 million views. Just on my channel, people re-upload it all the time. 
And it, the basic gist of the video is an Algerian starts boasting to me about this isn't this is before the start, the camera start rolling or before I cut the camera, um, starts boasting of how the Jews were ethnically cleansed from Algeria. He was really proud of this, and then he turns and said, "We'll give you Israel on one condition." I said, "Okay, I'm all ears. What is that? You convert to Islam and worship Allah." I yeah, see. I saw this clip. Yeah. And, and, and so then you become dimmies. You're like, I'm not going to become yeah. dimmy. Yeah, so I basically said, uh, look, how dare you? We were conf we were worshipping one God before your prophet was born. Not only that, your prophet had incredible respect for Jews and Jews practicing Those Judaism. Those are the facts. And uh, I don't know if I can remember this in it, but as an example, um, two Jews came to Muhammad. They wanted judgment. He was sitting on a pillow, according to their tradition. He took the pillow out from under it and placed it on a table and put the Sefer Torah on the on the pillow, out of kavod, out right. of respect, mm -hmm. and so I bring these examples of their prophet and respecting. And he he then started telling me what I believe, and I said, no, no, this is what I believe: la ilaha illallah, which means there's no god but God. And he said, Muhammad is the messenger of God, and I la Musa Rasulullah, which is Moses, Moses is the yes. messenger of God. And I gave other examples and I said, look, how dare you tell me to apostate from my faith when your own prophet was happy from my faith and respected my religion to this extent. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of comments under this video, all from Muslims. One comment alone has 11,000 likes and it is, as a Muslim, the Jew is right. Um, uh, so what uh, I'm hearing is that you 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 have to know a lot. You have to be fluent in or not fluent or well versed in the Quran. Like you can't just. I I, I throw out the equivalent of Baruch Hashem. <laughs> it's like it's this is not. You don't need enough? to be a scholar. Right. You, you 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 need you need a, the equivalent is Christian missionaries. Christian missionaries come into our community, and they will have like different pesukim in which they can go to. And if you're not well, if you're not Rabbi Singer or someone who's well versed in counter missionary you can get stuck on their questions and it can be confusing and the average Jew may have a hard time answering. The minute you take that Christian missionary away from that puzzle and take them just to the one previous, they start floundering because they, they, right. they, they have enough information to come in and cause the Jewish community a lot of problems right. in terms of taking but us away from our faith. their argument is weak. Their but arguments it, are weak, right? they, And their knowledge is surface deep. Right. So I guess there's an element of confidence that you have to have because I think that's what people, what throws people off. Because, like I said earlier, they come raging at you and they're yelling things in your face. You're like, "Wow, they must be really convinced." But you're saying, if you have a little patience and a little confidence in what you know, you can easily uh, disprove what they're saying, and then they have to, they let down their defenses a little, and there's room for conversation. But when we watch those videos of you in those crowds, like. There, that's scary stuff. I don't know if our kids should be all like uh, people watching should not encourage their kids to like jump into a crowd of aggressive Muslims and start start uh, debating them. That's not for the. That's not for your. You know, like the, the, that's when they say about the professional stunts. Like this should not be done at home. So I'm going to get in trouble with all the parents, but I think that's that's exactly where your children Same. should be. Yeah. Um, and I'll give you the example. Like, what I mean, in, when, in your when, faces. when Muslim, there are now there were far more Muslims in the UK than Jews today. And the Jews all came over. We were Moishi in the synagogue and Martin in society. Okay, yeah, yeah. No, we, we had our English name and our shul name. And Muhammad came. And he was Muhammad in the mosque. In the mosque. The most, and Muhammad it, in the... And, I think it's the most popular name in Israel. And, Muhammad. It, it, it's it's <laughs> also, in, also in the UK now. Um, <laughs> yeah. variations and France of and England. And, yeah. and, but the, the point of that is, if, if you have a crowd of Jews waving an Israeli flag, I can guarantee you in London, if one Muslim who hates Israel walks past, he will start screaming free, free Palestine at them. Now, I think we should be doing the same. I think if you see a big, and believe me, pro-Palestinian protests are not pro-Palestinian, they're anti-Israel. They are anti-Israel. They they're are marching Hamas. for the destruction of Hamas. Israel. Um, they're not marching. If they, if they were marching for, for two states, for two people, then you would see two flags. You don't. If you turn up with an Israeli flag, they'll attack you. But that's exactly what we should see. If you see an anti-Israel demonstration, you should turn up with your one flag and start screaming at them. And if you can, throw a camera on you so it inspires people to do it. I'll give you a real example. Um, Khomeini has some, he launched something called Al Quds Day, which is a, a, a Shia um, pro Hezbollah march, which used to take, takes place around the world, world. But in London, it used to take place every year. And there was a sea of Hezbollah flags paraded down London Street. I looked at my wife. My wife, um, she's five foot. She was wearing a ticket. I said, we need, we need a 
we need to do something. We need to stand up to these people. So we turned up, just my wife, my wife on the camera, me with some flyers and an Israeli flag, and started flyering all the Hezbollah nicks um, for, for Israel. The purpose of that was to film it and say, look, here's one Jew and his wife um, taking on a horde of Hezbollah supporters. Where is the Jewish community? The next year we were able to mobilize over 500 people to stand against the, the march. The next year, 1,500 people. And a few years later, we were able to get from enough pressure on government, the entire, well, not the march um, banned, but the, the Hezbollah flags um, banned from the march. And Hezbollah ultimately prescribed as a terror group in the UK. So you're like, uh, listen, you're, the, you're the, the, the hero that goes into the Yamsuf and then it has to split. Like someone has to be the first one, the first zealot to, you know, to, to prove that this is that, that this is the way to do it. We have to be forceful. We have to be strong. But I don't know. This is a constant conversation that we're having in all our WhatsApp chats. You know, those of us in this community of like minded people trying to defend Israel. Um, what is what is Taka the best strategy and what's the best way to reach people? And I know I think some people would argue that staying away from them is probably the safest bet because we're outnumbered. Um, and, and this is a conversation that I, well, I want to continue in this, in this uh, I want to maybe take a tangent, but our youth are not prepared. They're not prepared. And it could be very frightening to end up in a mob of people that are shouting in your faces. And we saw some amazing clips, you know, since October 7th of heroes standing with their flags and, and, and like singing. I actually saw in Sydney this, this girl, she, she played like Shema Yisrael, like on a, on a college campus at three o'clock in the morning where they were all camped out. And that was like, it was nice. It was like, you know, you, we also have to make ourselves heard, but we're, we're, we're outnumbered. We're outnumbered. We, yeah, we, this is very intimidating. But we're outnumbered here. And we're not weak need here, and we stand tall here, and we we no, no we're in Israel. No one shies away from being Israeli here. No one hides being Jewish here. Everyone is incredibly proud, and they're not weak need. And in Hutzla Aretz, we also need to adopt that Israeli, that Zionist attitude of not being weak need. If someone step, steps up to intimidate you, we need to rise up and stare them directly in the eye and not show fear. The most um, I can't fight for toffee. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a tough Jew. I, I can barely You're do. Not a ninja. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I refuse to be intimidated by those that seek to cause our people harm. And I think that's what we need to do. We need to confront. They're not afraid, so we can't recoil uh, and be intimidated. And I think by they them. respect strength. I mean, we always say peace, peace through strength. And and it's a big argument here in Israel. But how we approach our enemies and how we you know, to, I guess you could also say this is psychological warfare, but how we impress upon them that we're strong and, you know, the message that our c commanders give to Iran, those are those are messages to, sh to show strength. And that's how you have to deal with people who yeah. use intimidation. You have to intimidate them back. And not just strength, but also pride. I'll give you another example. There's a convicted terrorist, I believe he's in jail at the moment for terrorism, called Abdul Hakim. I've debated him many times. He knows me quite well. Um, he was behind the Sharia patrols in London, whereas if you um, were dressed on Sniut, um in a Muslim neighborhood, if you weren't dressed modestly, they would tell you to leave. If you were drinking alcohol, they'd ask you to leave. If you didn't, right. they'd attack you. Um, he was in a documentary called The Jihadis Next Door on Channel 4, which is one of our national um, channels. And he was in that documentary with Khurram Butt, who was the terrorist who carried out the London Bridge terror attack. So this is a hardcore convicted terrorist. I debated um, someone called Mohammed Hijab, another prominent Muslim, many times. And I noticed one of the comments years ago under one of mine and Mohammed's debates, and it was from Abdul Hakim. And he said, I never thought I'd say this, but Joseph has more al wala wal bara than the Muslims, which is more love and hate for the sake of Hashem, or Allah, uh, wow. of God, than the Muslims. He made an impression on him. He loves his people. And so he should. How can we expect anything else from him? So the, why was he responding to Muhammad Hijab like that? Because I, was, I wasn't caveating my you love and support for my people. I wasn't like one of the most frustrating things I see from our camp, particularly those that are more liberal or to the left is, I love Israel. I'm a Zionist, but, and there's always a but. I don't like Netanyahu, but I don't support the settlements. But 
and they caveat, they put conditions on their love or support for Israel. The other side don't do that. Um, and so we always... Good point. And so it's the same with we our tradition. We can't apologize for ourselves. This is who we are, and th these are our family members, and this is our country, and we're not perfect, but we're going to fight, you know, we're going to yeah. fight with tooth and nail. 100, and it's the same with our tradition. Like, the, you ne I've never met a Muslim that says, oh, I love Islam. But you know what? Some of those laws <laughs> the there, they're they a bit women. dated. <laughs> and, and so for, for my, we do. It's like you, you hear so many Jews that, oh, I love Judaism, but this part's a little bit dated. Or oh, we need to update this part. I, I know better than here. And look, there can be things you don't necessarily. Like I was raised in a progressive left-wing household. There are things in our tradition which are harder to swallow okay, for yeah. me. But you don't caveat. You don't, you don't change the law. You don't apologize for it. You are proudly it Jewish. Has, right. You proudly the follow the tradition. Mm -hmm. And so if you can embrace your Judaism, if you can embrace, and the Judaism really matters, particularly with Muslims, it really matters. If you can embrace your Judaism, if you can embrace your Zionism, and you don't caveat, and you're not apolo apologizing for being Jewish and Zionist, then you are much more likely or your message is much more likely to be received as sincere um and, and with respect and well for people who want who are watching and and they need that boost and they need that you know injection of pride you know in their veins what what would you recommend they read or watch or listen to for you example you, i mean i, I you don't it's like even, the Bible. <laughs> no, no, it's, 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 it, it, it doesn't have to be. You don't have to read. You don't. You just need to look at our history. We're this tiny, insignificant desert tribe, like a few families wandering around the the, the hills or these hills, the Judean hills, and yet somehow our contribution to humanity has been a mess. All the corners immense. of the globe. Well, it's not. It's like Western civilization was built on the backbone of the moral code, the monotheistic code that we introduce values, yeah. to the world. Like our contribution is immense. And the fact that so many people have rose up to slaughter us, yet every single one of us has the blood of warriors, survivors, rage, like we descend from those that survived um, the Nazis, the Syrians, the Egyptians, the Romans. I know, it's so uh, true. It's like, why would you even start up with the Jews? We all know how this ends. Yeah, we, we have like the we, blood of heroes. Yeah. And so but, but you they, don't need to read a book to be proud. You need to look at your, look at your okay. grandparents. Look at your great-grandparents. Look right. at the people you come from and be proud of that embrace and contribute it to it. And embrace it. And do something. Do so, like, I often get asked by people, how can I help? Like, so they, I, I've been doing this for a while. And they ask me, how, what do I need to read? How do I, look, most of the people I speak to are better educated than me, more articulated than me, stronger than me, and they could do everything. Believe, okay. No, no, no. One, yeah. uh, this is not. This is not false humility. I, I, I'm a nervous public speaker. If you put me You're on the stage great. of people, thank you. <laughs> I start trembling. I'm comfortable around Nazis and Islamists, but anything outside <laughs> of that is a little nerve wracking for me. And most of the people I speak to don't have these um, insecurities and weaknesses. And they could do such a better job than I do. The only reason they don't is they don't take that first step. And so the like, I believe in yourself. You can do it. If you're if you're doubting yourself, Joseph's telling you you can do it. So with my, the very little knowledge I have in all of this, I, I've taught myself how to use a camera, how to film, how to create viral videos, how to do. And last year, 100 million people watched my videos, and that's with. Zero budget, zero training. And had you zero not energy. done it, 100 million people, less people 100%. would have heard those arguments. Those very important uh, arguments. The most important thing someone can do is to do something. It's like Judaism. If you do nothing, the tradition dies with you. If you light Shabbat candles, if you do something, you can pass something on to the next generation. You can preserve Judaism. And it's the same with Zionism. If you do one thing, if it's a social media post, if it's attending a protest, if it's convincing a friend who has been lied to and has false information, whatever it is, just doing something is the difference between the death of our people, the death of Zionism and our survival. Let me ask you, um, your English, I hope, at some point, you'll be officially Israeli. I'm always pushing people to make Aliyah. So, God willing, we hope that's in the plan. Um, but let's just speak on this past year for a minute. For people who don't have the merit of being here in Israel like we do at the moment, can you tell us a little bit about what you learned about the Jewish people and our strength and our resilience in the last year? Maybe share some inspiring uh anecdote something that just because i know that 
I, I'm, I'm a completely different person. My perspectives have completely changed and I am more and deeply, more deeply in love with Amistral than I ever could imagine, like obsessed, like with all of it. So inspire us a little, like how has your connection deepened since October 7th? And I know that you've seen it all and heard it all and you know, you see the hate in their eyes and you could almost imagine that they're gonna do this, but then they do it and it's painful and it hurts and we're mourning and sometimes it's all too much. I mean, we're all a little tired, like it's, so inspire us a little with uh, some of the things you've seen and heard. So I've probably seen and heard a lot less than you because you've been here since October the 7th. Um, I've been here a few months now, but what's blown my mind this time around is the level of unity. Prior to October the 7th, there was so much chatter of it's going to be a civil war. There's going to like, with the, the, the left can't with, with, live with the right. The religious can't live with the secular. It's just the country's tearing itself apart. That conversation has disappeared. The Jewish people have never had such such unity as we, we have today. And I think the other thing which has really surprised me is like the, the, the strength of the people in, in Israel. Now, I, I'll give you an example. On the 13th, 14th of April, the Iranians fired some ballistic missiles. So was, some. Yeah. I, 300 I, the yeah. size of uh, buses and refrigerators. And I just arrived in the country. I like This is literally, we've Welcome been here Israel. for a week. <laughs> Find and a shelter. It, so we've been here a week and the the sirens go off and I'm panicking. Cause it, was, it was even worse than that. It's like I'm in a number of different groups with people who are very well connected with what's going on at a government level, at a military level. And I got news that the drones had been fired relatively early, as, as many people did. And I looked at my wife and I was like, the Iran's just fired drones at us. She start, she turns white. She's like, what, what, what do we do? How, when are they arriving? And I was like, eight hours. It's like, <laughs> what, do, what do we do for eight hours? So Pray. my wife went to Sleep. bed. I went on Twitter. Yeah. Um, but then the sirens went. I panicked. I, I, I wanted to film a video about it, but I'm shaking. Yeah. My hand, I run down to our bomb shelter. And the, like 15 minutes later, I so said, we hear a few explosions overhead. We, we emerge. We're quite shaken. We've never experienced this before. And I'm lying in bed and I hear what sounds like a tank rolling down. We're in Jerusalem. Yeah. Um, I hear a tank rolling down the street and I'm like, this is insane. There's literally tanks in Jerusalem. But you know what? I create content. I create social media. Yeah. So I rushed outside with my camera to film the tank. And this is 10 minutes after the, the, the missiles had just been intercepted. And it was the garbage men collecting the bins. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, these people are tough. They are not shaken by anything. That's and, great. And it's the people were at the beach the next day. They were doing jazzercise, <laughs> yoga. It's true. And, and it's so true. it's this combination of fearless strength and complete unity like secular people like there's a million stories like this but one of the ones that touched me was there was a um soldier and a Haredi guy an older Haredi guy and the Haredi guy saw that the soldier is about to go to Gaza it's the beginning of the war he says look is there anything is there anything I can do can I can I get you and the guy some food what can, what can is there anything I can do and this completely secular soldier looked at him and said I don't have any tzitzit um can can you help and he and the the, the Haredi guy said look I've only got the telekatan I'm wearing and he takes it off and said but you can wear this he gives uh, it to the the secular soldier yeah. who puts it on and the soldier says I look forward to giving you this back in a couple of weeks now, I'm not sure that couple of weeks actually wow. manifests because our oh, boys unfortunately have been there for a long time but um, stories like that of secular religious coming together and absolute refusal to cower at the, the enemies yeah. at the gate. I love it. I love it. That is so on point. Joseph, you're incredible. You're inspiring. Where can people find you? Okay, so my organization is the Israel Advocacy Movement. We're on all platforms, um, Twitter, um, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. Um, so, yeah. Keep an eye right. And if you're a terrorist, ignore all of that. No, um, no, no, come listen. We're, we're going <laughs> to oh, convert actually, you. We're going to bring you. If you're a terrorist, bring it on. <laughs> bring it on. Thank you so much for being here. Repeat after me. I'm Yisrael Chai. I'm Yisrael Chai. So there you have it. Episode 208 of the Weekly Squeeze. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and now YouTube. Head over to the show note links to sign up for Daily Giving to order some Queen Tulsi and to join our WhatsApp chat. You can also follow me on Instagram 
at my beautiful land of Israel. And we will see you next week.